Welcome to the Audiation in the Wild podcast with your hosts, Bo Talifer and Eric Rasmussen. Season 2, Episode 7, Taking a Look at Partial Synthesis. All right, Eric, you ready to lose some friends? <laughs> I don't know if I have any left to lose. <laughs> oh, no. Okay, so we were having a conversation off air, and I said something uh, which I thought was interesting. We'll see if everyone else does. I made the claim that partial synthesis is in the wrong order, and to my delightful surprise, uh, you don't seem like you disagree with that, like flat out. <laughs> Now, it's a nuanced Me? discussion. I'm not saying we should rewrite learning sequences of music. It, it belongs where it is in, towards, in terms of Gordon's music learning theory um, uh, as appropriate uh, there as it is elsewhere, which I think is more appropriate, is that kids need to... So it's... It, kids need to experience differences. Nobody argues with that. That's one of the hallmarks of... Gordon music learning theory in early childhood is like the more context meters and tonalities the better and then I like functions let's get some functions in there too right inside of the uh, inside of the tonalities that you've got your listening vocabulary in inside of the meters you got your listening vocabulary in and as they start to imitate like the more they have in the variety of contexts the better I'm so there there are differences that must be be there just in terms of giving kids content but when you start talking about um the formal learning so now we're into discrimination learning and you know getting kids from the bridge uh, over the imitation bridge into audiation um they still need those differences side to side well before you've gotten to verbal associates and using verbal associates or names for for concepts or uh, verbal associates for you know the the tonal pad tonal you know tonal syllables let's say or rhythm syllables there is something to that that partial synthesis there's something it's very strong to say it but partial synthesis is something that's in the background of my teaching all the time Mm -hmm. Me too. Are they are they making differences? Are they hearing differences? You know, even when they're improvising, it's it's there. And, or, you know, certainly the typical way is is fine, but there's something more about what comparing uh, tonalities or functions or meters mm -hmm. gives a student. If you keep giving the opportunity to play with them side by side. You know, the, the, my way, of course, is doing, do you want me to do Twinkle Twinkle Little Star the right way or the wrong way? Sure. And that's one of my ways into partial synthesis where they have a little bit of a, you know, agency in what they're learning now. Totally. I love that. So one of the, one of the reasons I said this is, um, so partial synthesis is this very specific activity that we talk about in NLT where let's use tonal patterns for example major tonal patterns major tonic and dominant so the students got to the point where they've done enough oral oral formally they've done the verbal association they've they've sung the patterns with the solfege and now you're gonna um after they've gone through that with another set of content so they've done the major ones and the dominant ones now they're gonna do the minor ones and the dominant you get to this point with partial synthesis where you can actually you can actually force them to prove that they know which one is which by listening only. And, and there's activities for doing this. There's tons of different activities you can do this with. The only claim I'm making is that if you look at this a certain way, the verbal associate is actually, like it has no cash value until you do the partial association, uh, par partial synthesis. And I think everyone agrees on that. But there's a more nuanced discussion here um, about questioning the validity of even teaching the verbal associate before you've done something that's like partial synthesis. So I'm not saying um, the, the way that it's done traditionally is wrong. I'm just saying there is actually another way you can do this. No, it's really super... explicit. I want to go to bat for it. It's really explicit so that you can actually take the names and the, and the, uh, you know, the, the syllables and make connections. And they're, they're just, um, 
you know, they had the teacher make those connections and then show you how they made those connections. And then you go through that process and you've made the connection. Mm -hmm. And then you have a, a, a stronger hold of your verbal, verbal associates and what they mean. So uh, an example of this, um, I have quite a few drum students right now, which is so fun with teaching MLT. It's ridiculous. And this new student who, you know, we've done a lot of patterns before. He's been taking piano with me for a couple months, but then he switched to drums. He's doing all these double patterns, all these triple patterns. I'm not labeling anything yet. Once he's playing this stuff really well, you can teach, you can do verbal association, symbolic association, and the partial synthesis activities pretty much all at the same time. There's not a, there's not actually a need to separate these and, and, and prolong them. And, you know, even I can feel while I say that, like some hypothetical pushback to this. But the reason, the reason that I'm saying this um, is, is really inspired by Engelman. I mean, Engelman went as far to say that teaching, giving a label for a concept, and again, you refer to our last episode for the death, for what I mean by concept. Giving a label to a concept um, doesn't make any sense until you've basically done partial synthesis. So what, like, what does that mean? And I think one of the reasons, Eric, that you're not inherently allergic to what I'm saying is that you do this when you teach harmonic learning sequence. You're already I doing know. that. <laughs> and I so I, I, I feel like if you didn't have that, like, I don't know what would be going on. I would, but... expl I would explode. I would. The same as in you with your pitch letter name. <laughs> <laughs> so so w let's walk through this with the yes-no game. So can you can you again describe for, for everyone how the yes-no game works and how you start teaching functions? And then we'll we'll tack on, you know, what we're doing here to that. I w yeah, I wonder if this will work here, if you can hear it without me feeding back. Can you stop there? Fleece is white as. Can we stop there? No. Do you stop here? Yes. Remember, this is no. And this is yes. And then there's more instructions. And it's like, remember, this is no. And this is yes. So there's a couple, you know, um, I don't want to say, uh, inversions uh, because the root is always the root it's always the right root voicings uh, voicings yeah so I changed the voicings at the top yeah thanks uh, and the kids in you know in less than three minutes can answer ten questions half of those three minutes are the directions and a two-year-old can do it two and a half year old can do it all the way up to eight and then of course adults they have trouble with it so, so what blew um, my so mind with this mind. is like I was reading Gordon really stuff, I was reading Engelman really stuff, then I found you and, and I started seeing how you do this. You, the way you set this up is exactly what Engelman says to do for inductively teaching discriminations. Is you, you give them a bunch of positive examples and negative examples next to each other and you say, this is what I'm talking about, this is not an example of what I'm talking about. So you're using the, the essentially the tonic as, yeah. as that. And they need familiarity something so that they already recognize it that, that it's you know that it didn't finish yeah and that, i mean that so so i've got an argument about uh me i should be playing something unfamiliar but that makes it harder and i don't want to make it harder i want to make it as easy as possible and and so i mean engelman would not disagree with you on this is, is you you have to follow what actually works when you do it with the kids and if starting with a familiar song actually works and starting with an unfamiliar song at first doesn't work then what do you do you do the one that like empirically works yeah it's it's much easier to do a song that is familiar because most everybody knows the song and if you don't know the song well then the te test is invalid for you know so don't use it <laughs> you can't use it there use one that's that's better so it's contextually appropriate but sure. almost everybody knows uh, Mary Had a Little Lamb. And Mary Had a Little Lamb is easier than doing Twinkle, even though Twinkle might be more popular. Sure. It's the harmonic progression that's in it that yeah, I... that sets up the example. And I do, you know, sing it. So, Mary Had a Little Lamb, Little Lamb, Little Lamb. Mary Had a Little Lamb, Fleece as White as. And I slow down and I go, no. <laughs> you know, can you end there? No, that's painful. It's no, yes. Will you remember this? Is yes. And this is. Playing is no.
Okay, so let's go back to the claim I made that you can kind of collapse all this stuff into one short exercise. So after you teach that to somebody, I don't know if you actually go on to this, but if you were to then immediately tell them, hey, just hold this finger up whenever you hear the, the yes chord, that is a type of symbolic association. That is a visual representation of a discrimination that you taught. But what's interesting yeah. is you don't have to protract this out over weeks. So like you can immediately teach them to make that discrimination and then boom, put the label on it and some kind of visual representation. It can happen so fast. You, yeah. know, you don't have to buy discrimination, you buy rote, teach them, you know, a label that they repeat. And and so what I found interesting about this whole way of looking at the skill learning sequence is it it kind of makes for me, it made more sense for why it's actually working, you know, because partial synthesis has this rap of being like mysterious to teach and teachers are not good at doing it. But I think the reason that it gets that rap is that people don't understand the underlying mechanism of, of, of providing examples of same and different that is at the root of partial synthesis. The label is just this inconsequential thing we actually tack onto it that turns out to be very useful for having discussions and organizing your thinking. But the root of partial synthesis is strategically showing similarities and differences. And that's what you meant by saying partial synthesis is in the background of your teaching. Because you're always doing that, whether or not you're explicitly pushing the label onto it or not. You're always like switching, right way, wrong way, right chord, wrong chord, right tonality, wrong tonality. And, and that's why people with high aptitude perform well, is that they have, whatever you want to call it, more musical working memory to pull that off on their own and under guidance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. My partial synthesis really is as soon as I do a, a song, my hello song, as soon as that's done, I do a chant <laughs> and my hello songs major. So as soon as my chant is over, I do something in minor. And it's almost consistently been that way for 20 years. Sure. So they're getting something sung, something not sung, <laughs> something said. Right, and then different tonality, and then you just keep doing that, and you right, and you do three weeks in a row, and you take a week or two off, and then you bring it back. Mm -hmm. um, but you're always giving them the variety of contexts and styles, uh, all 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 of it you can, uh, repeating them enough that they can um, grasp it or recognize it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's my basis for, you know, their listening and moving vocabulary. Mm -hmm. And that, and then from that, everything else springs, springs, you know, at the end of, at the end of songs or during songs, I'll be doing uh, syllables. Sure. Just the roots uh, or, or, uh, or just the, uh, you know, the rhythms. Like, oh, do da di do. This is, this is moving in threes. Do da di do. You hear it? Mm -hmm. Oh, it just changed. Do day, do day, do. And I'll say that before I've taught rhythm syllables to them. Just like, just listen. Exactly. Yeah, you know, before I've taught them patterns necessarily, because in a larger context, those things are more meaningful. I think labeling the context um, than labeling yeah. the pattern. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that's what's crazy about this is like Engelman actually talks about that in theory of instruction. He talks about how higher level concepts need to be labeled before low, lower level. And I, I, I took some inspiration from this to start labeling the tonality um, before I label any tone. So I'll do familiar songs in major and minor and just teach them the word major and minor at, after, the, after I know they can tell me which one is which. And then I, I haven't taught like la is the resting tone or do is the resting tone. And that might sound very odd to most MLT teachers, but, you know, taking this inspiration from Engelman, it's, it's easier to label the higher order concepts before the lower order ones. Now, that doesn't mean there isn't more precision in labeling the resting tone. But what's funny is you can teach that to almost any kid who knows a familiar Mary Had a Little Lamb or Twinkle. You can teach them the label major and minor in like under a minute. Yeah. Now, I do it the other way around. Sure. And I think it has to do with, with you know, uh, guitar teaching is easier uh, in some ways and more difficult, probably mostly more difficult than so many other ways in yeah. terms of the way it looks uh, compared to when I'm putting something onto a, a piano or whatnot. But when I'm dealing with kids without the instrumental, uh, uh, with, without any visual, without uh, 
you know an instrument to to work with those kids are getting uh resting tone because resting tone do re mi or whatever yep uh so that they can have access to all the resting tones right away Sure. So they just they don't they know do re mi fa sol la ti. So what resting tone do you want? And I I let them, you know, pick pick the ones I hate the most because <laughs> they love to tease me. But um, but those kids once they have that, just oh I should call them major and minor. They just swap out the label. It's it, that's totally. what the adults adults do. So I do it that way, and I have no problem with you doing it your way. Um, I think partly too because most of your kids are older than seven. Sure, sure. But what, something, the something the like real that. thing that interested me about this is the fact that they can do it without labeling the resting tone. It is in the realm of possible, and it and it it's it's teachable oh, yeah. just as fast as you do the yes no game. Um, yeah. You know, I'll also say here, like one of the reasons I ended up um, doing that with my own students, I'm not necessarily recommending other people do this, is that um, you know I've been on this whatever you want to call it this hobby horse of teaching parallel tonalities before relative ones. And so if you, if you're, if you're teaching movable though with a law bass minor, the, the resting tones are super, super useful because they help you discriminate between the tonalities very easily. If you teach with the same damn pitch as the resting tone, you need another way to differentiate between major and minor because C is always the resting tone. Yeah. So, so I'm not I'm not advocating that other people do this. I'm just I'm just explaining my thought process behind this. And there's some very practical applications when you start getting people to play stuff on the guitar, where going through it like that can it, it seems to increase the speed that they learn this stuff at. Um, and there's a whole other conversation about theory that we we have to get that, into. That can sneak into, but no, they need those differences right butt up against each other so they can really hear. You know, they really want them to be tickled by hearing twinkle and minor. I want them to laugh at it or or be interested in it or have some kind of recognition. They, that's crazy. You know, what are you doing? You know, uh, Jingle Bells is great because <laughs> it's so startling. And that it's on the third, uh, you know, so if me, me, me is right. And, <laughs> you know, and do, do, do is just wrong. You know. It's fun to do this with with functions too. Like I'll often teach "Happy Birthday" by Rote as like one of the first songs that students learn on the piano specifically, and I'll play chords over it. And after like one or two lessons, I'll put like a really put like a half like a minor seven flat five off the two at the very end of it, and it has this like kind of sounds like the minor four chord. It has a sad quality to it. Mm -hmm. And after a week or two of hearing the regular chords, that shift makes them like do a double take. And so there's a lot of chances for, you know, this street version of partial synthesis that we're talking about. It's really, we're just talking about strategically placing same and different examples. That's a good way I, to put it. Because I'm using the term the, in a different way. It's in the air. It, it's like the differences are in the air everywhere you go, as opposed to the this particular skill that you're delivering to combine familiar patterns, right, that are, right, that are strung together, which helps establish context without saying what context it is. You're helping them understand context specifically without, well, man, partial synthesis. I, it needs to be re-looked at. Uh, so you said something really interesting. So I don't necessarily think we're advocating that anyone, like when they're teaching tonal and rhythm patterns, changes what they're doing, oral, oral, verbal association, partial synthesis, but there are some musical concepts and concept in a very literal way. Some audiated material is not well serviced by that model, like the harmonic learning stuff. No, it, 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 it's because it's because it's partial synthesis from the beginning, actually, you know, is recognizing, identifying differences and sameness. But but the same thing is for style. You can't you can't have someone listen to blues and say, "Hey, that's blues," and then now do partial synthesis. The word blues doesn't make sense unless you compare it with something else that's not blues. So mm -hmm. it's actually only worth introducing the word blues once they can tell that it's different than something else. And so it kind of it calls into question the ordering of when you even teach a label. Or or in another way of saying it is that if you're going to teach a verbal associate before you do the synthesis, you have to know that it's flimsy. 
And yeah. which which is what Gordon says. I mean, unless you do partial synthesis, the verbal associate or the label is they're flimsy. They're not because you're not proving that the student is actually synthesizing them with their audiation. It's just something that's and you hear this with students all the time. You hear students they'll sing the right tonal pattern, but say the wrong verbal associate. Yeah. And that's proof yeah. that it's you know, it's it's not it's it's not melded together yet. Yeah, in which case, you know, you, you do more repetitions of those tonal patterns, but exactly. Uh, but if they hear the harmonic functions ahead of the tonal patterns, then it's much easier. Because they hear functions, they hear the tonal patterns easier. Tonal patterns, I've said this, I don't know how many, umpteen times, tonal patterns come from functions, not the other way around. And there's no way, <laughs> you know, why did he develop the tonal patterns that he did? Because they're they're representative of the functions he wanted kids to learn. Well, mm -hmm. the functions can be learned without the tonal patterns, which, you know, I've got two and three-year-olds who can't sing tonal patterns, but they know three or four functions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's my experience. I, I, I get everyone to big two. So on Eric's sequence, you learn tonic, dominant, and then whatever you want, four and big two. That, that's the standard. The double, yeah, double, double dominant. Double dominant, or the five is, of two, is, five of five. Yeah, I try not to do the, the numbers. I don't even think about like, verbal associates with tonal patterns until they can do that. Like, it's not even in my um, yeah. universe. Well, I mean, once they do that, I'm, I know that they can hear something harmonically. And then, and then labeling patterns tends to get easier after that. Yeah, well, uh, mi, la, re, so, do uh, is the end of this little light of mine. Re so do is different than the re so do if it's a minor two, right? So mm -hmm. I always put those right up against each other. The first time I teach one of them, I teach the other. Mm -hmm. The minor, you know, uh, two five one instead of double dominant five one. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah they got it. If you do that, it just makes it so much easier for them to recognize the difference. There's also and some then we take them out of context, out of the context of the mm -hmm. song. Or what I do is I put the wrong. Change in, in uh, lollipop, lollipop, ooh, lolly, lolly, and I do, ma you know, do double dominant, dominant tonic. Oh, it, it just it rankles the kids if, that, if they know if they know it, and how do they know it? I don't know. Uh, you know, it's still the root ray, but it's little ray and big ray. That's what I I'll do it when they don't have a name for it. Exactly. Yeah. You know, when they don't know where it's already going. So, um, yeah, it, it just unravels easily if you watch for what the kids are, are able. you got to get out of the way of how you're teaching and let the kids let you help them learn. This opens up a whole other discussion about <laughs> how you set up curriculum because um, I'm very much, you know, in the womb of chaos in my lessons. You know, I'm, I'm figuring out stuff by ear. I'm, I'm just like, where do they want this to go next? And I understand that that's not tenable often in a group setting. And it's just not tenable for some people's personalities. They don't, they can't do that. But if you're receptive to like, well, what can they audiate right now? And how could I introduce sameness and difference around that to make them audiate more stuff, essentially? That's what we're getting at. And it becomes so fun because the lesson is, um, you know, you just haranguing them on their on their favorite songs and changing notes, and like sometimes I'll I'll play a melody from a song that they've requested to learn, but I'll I'll purposely change one of the notes, and I'll just see if they react to it. And yeah, <laughs> like, yeah well, no, most of the time they do. Yeah, it's amazing that you can change yes and no, and make something just horrendous. For sure. Please, <laughs> why does no? You know, like. Ugh, it really matters where the chord changes. <laughs> and so, yeah, now I, yeah, it, it lets them have agency in deciding what they want to change and how they want to change it and just experiment like they do with blocks in the corner of the room. You know, there's no right way. Eventually, they'll learn that the big ones are better on the bottom, you know. Sure. If you, unless they're being really strategic about how the little ones support the big one. Um, that's hard to do. Um, and so I let them tear down what I'm doing, give them the vocabulary to tell me what to do, because they, kids love to tell you what to do. Mm -hmm. 
and I'm doing it in, you know, in the process of helping them develop their audiation. That's the only thing I teach in that in, yeah. in movement, I think, which is audiation well, too. Well, that's related uh, to what we're talking about. Introducing a sense of autonomy into the lessons is, is so important for their just feeling connected to the, to the lessons. I mean, I, I often pause after teaching a melody because we're doing a lot of stuff I wrote. I say, hey, do you want to learn the next part of this song or just a new song? Like, you know, because if you're not into the next part, I mean, what are we doing here? <laughs> yeah, I do. You know, once they got major and minor down and they might call it, you know, so do or mi la at the end, or they would call it rest in tone do and rest in tone la or whatever. When I introduce Mixolydian, I do a lot of familiar songs they already know in Mixolydian. And I do a song that's familiar that's not supposed to be in Mixolydian. I do it so Mixolydian's wrong there. Mm -hmm. And and that's how I present Mixolydian to the kids. Like, you know, these these are all, and everybody sing fa so at the end, fa so, and just it, and that's it. And then and, and, the I next mean, time I'll not, review it and review it. This is not it, even then, just for early childhood. Like there, like there are direct applications for very advanced music making. Like. I, I'm learning harmonic minor tonalities right now, I, uh, and I I compare okay Lydian sharp two compared to Lydian, and I'll just keep improvising between the two, and they become much more crystallized in your mind when you have something familiar to compare it to, or even the Locrian stuff I was showing you earlier. This is like uh, yeah. So this is this is we're not Which just talking the, the flat five chord, right? <laughs> I don't know why in learning sequences in music. The five chord, or the chord based off of fa in Locrian, is not as an essential function. It, yeah. uh, I'm not saying it's the only one, but it's I, it's the best one by far. Yeah, like someone and, dropped and the I, ball on this. And I just ignore it. <laughs> I just ignore Locrian. Yeah, we're gonna. I think we're gonna start doing some acculturation of yeah. some, some funky stuff on here soon. All right. Well, so. I mean, it's an interesting discussion. You know, we'd love to hear feedback from people. So, you know, tell us what you like, tell us what you don't like. But yeah, yeah, this is uh, this is going to go down some fun, fun rabbit holes for sure. All right, all right. Till next time. Thanks. Later.